Before continuing on with the description of our work, I'm going to provide a little broader context. Although we may not realize it, the distribution of plants and animals is constantly changing. Sometimes these changes occur in great spurts that leave an obvious record of their occurrence, such as the great extinctions. And sometimes they are more gradual and the record is less evident and more difficult to uncover. Likewise, due in part to plate tectonics, their surface is constantly changing, as Margie has explained so well. Several times during the Pleistocene, when more of the Earth's water was tied up as ice on, on the land, sea level was lower than now, and Asia was connected to North America by a 1,000 kilometer wide plain across the Bering Strait, allowing plants and animals to migrate between the continents. Closer to home, one of Richard's graduate students documented 12,000 year old pollen of alpine bistort, which is, which is found on southern Vancouver Island 12,000 years ago, but is no longer found here, although it is now common on the Olympic Peninsula. In the next three slides, I'll illustrate three methods that are used to document past changes in vegetation, which in turn contribute to understanding the natural history of our province. I'll start with one method which is not part of our research, but is widely used. This is a work um, from uh, one of uh, Richard's former graduate students, graduate student. So, um, and Richard is one of the few people on the planet that knows two Kendricks. Um, so shown here, uh, I'll start with one method, as I said, is not part of our research. Shown here is a device to collect a sediment core. This one taken from a lake in the Chilcotin Plateau and the core itself. Slices of a core like this are prepared in such a way that only the pollen and spores remain. The pollen can be identified at the family level, for example, the sunflower family or the rose family, and often at the species level. Dates can be secured from radiocarbon analyses if there are larger fragments of plants remains within the, within the core, and from layers of ash of known ages, volcanic ash of known ages. On the far side is a pollen profile with dates on the left side, species on the top, and the, the relative abundance of each species indicated on the graph. Without looking too closely, you can see that the abundance of every species changes over time. Information about changes in past climate can be inferred from this figure, which is what Richard has, has devoted his career to. In 2014, researchers published a paper based on analysis of plant DNA from frozen sediments taken from 24 locations in the Arctic. In many cases, they could identify plants at the species level and could discern changes in vegetation over the past 50,000 years. To some extent, the story is different from that told by pollen analysis. In the following two slides, I will talk specifically, as Erica said, about the BC Alpine and what we are learning about past changes in vegetation and plant migrations based upon the current pattern of distribution of one species and DNA analysis of a second species. Looking for patterns in present day plant distributions is a starting, starting point to propose hypotheses to understand plas, past migrations. Shown here is a distribution map of Narcissus anemone, a species that we collected this past summer from a mountain near the BC Yukon border, indicated by the yellow triangle. The position of each dot is based on an actual physical specimen deposit, deposited in a publicly accessible collection. The black triangles are our collections from previous years. The dotted red line encloses the general area we, where we have made collections beginning in 2002. This species grows in open, moist alpine and subalpine meadows, a habitat that is common in the mountains of Western North America. But notice there is a large gap in its distribution. Despite the extensive suitable habitat in the higher mountains of Southern BC, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. So here's this large gap. And here the plant reappears again at the uh, Montana-Wyoming border just east of Yellowstone National Park on the Beartooth Plateau, and then again here in the mountains of northern Colorado. Surprisingly, no one had actually documented this pattern before. We stumbled upon it simply because I was curious to learn more about the distribution of Narcissus anemone. There are two possible explanations for this distribution pattern, one that biologists refer to as a disjunct distribution. Such distributions inevitably have an interesting story to tell, but it is not always clear what the message is. One possibility is long-distance dispersal, whereby propagules of a species 
disperse a great distance from one location to another without establishing populations in the intervening space. The biota of volcanic islands, think of Hawaii, are established in this manner. In the case of Narcissus anemone, long distance dispersal does not seem likely because the seeds are not adapted to travel great distance. A second possibility is that The second possibility is that during a colder period, when open tundra is widespread at lower elevations, this species and many others spread widely across Western North America. When the climate warmed, the only suitable habitat was on the mountaintops. The valley bottoms dried out, the slopes became forested. This explains how it could have become so widespread, but doesn't really explain the gap in the distribution. One possibility to explain the gap is that at some point in the past, Southern British Columbia was more heavily glaciated than the North. This species was completely extirpated and has not been able to reestablish populations since then for reasons that are not clear. The land is obviously not bare now, and many other species have reestablished populations, so why not Narcissus anemone? One final comment about the distribution of this species is its occurrence on Haida Gwaii in the Brooks Peninsula of northwest Vancouver Island. These two locations here. One of the lines of evidence that support the idea that these two locations were ice-free during their most recent ice advance is the absence of this and other species from the adjacent mainland, suggesting that populations in these locations are relictual. In other words, they were founded before the last glaciation and survived in these locations while the rest of the province was covered by ice. We're very fortunate to receive funding from the Weston Foundation and from a private donor to, to continue the DNA analysis that we've been working on sporadically since 2002 with our UVic collaborator, Dr. Geraldine Allen. Unlike pollen analysis, DNA analysis potentially allows one to understand the direction of species migrations. The results from this year's work have not been fully analyzed, so I'll explain what we have learned already based on earlier analyses. Shown here is a portion of what we are learning about a widespread Arctic and Alpine plant, mountain sorrel. It has turned out to be very informative, though we could not have known that before we began that research, this research, and that is often the nature of research. We have authored or co-authored three papers about the migration of this plant. In the most recent paper, we shared our samples with a lab in China that undertook a very detailed analysis of the species, including samples from North America, Asia, and Europe. Our own results from British Columbia indicate that there are five genetic lineages of this plant, and within each lineage, several genetic types. I will talk only about two of the southern lineages. There is a northern lineage that is not shown here. Each dot represents a location from which tissue was obtained and the DNA was sequenced. We, may, we made many of these collections ourselves, and I counted the number of other people who've helped us, and it's 27 other people have sent tissue to us um, of this species from locations that we cannot reach. And one, uh, one of these samples came from a herbarium specimen at the Canadian Museum of Nature. Keep in mind that the current dogma is that most of, British, most of Canada, including almost all of BC, except for the two locations I mentioned earlier, and the southern Yukon and southern Alaska, was covered by ice during the most recent ice advance. Therefore, it is assumed that all plants and animals migrated into the province from the north or from the south. As you can see, these two lineages have different patterns of distribution. Lineage B is absent from southern BC, whereas lineage E is widespread. It appears that lineage B was, was once more widespread and its distribution was disrupted by some event, possibly the most recent ice advance. That would make the most sense. Subsequently, lineage, lineage E migrated into BC from the south. If this is the case, then lineage B reached northern British Columbia before the last ice age and persisted in previously unsuspected ice-free refugia during the last ice advance. What I've presented here are the results of extensive field work to document plant distributions and DNA analysis to document plant migrations. Each approach indicates that the mountains of southern British Columbia have a different story than those of northern British Columbia. The DNA results in particular challenge the dogma that all of BC was covered by ice during the most recent ice age, a result that we could not anticipate, though we, especially Richard, had a hunch that this might be the case. Otherwise, we wouldn't have embarked on this. 
BC's Alpine is vast and remote, and our work is just scratching the surface of what remains to be learned, and not only about plants. Much more remains to be learned about insects, spiders, and fungi, among other groups of organisms. Thank you.